Good day, my name is Aubrey Duplessis and I will be spending the next few minutes on two very important legal instruments and how they relate to the topic of tobacco harm reduction. The first legal instrument is the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and the second legal instrument is the Tobacco Products Directive of the European Union. My presentation today will consist of four parts. I will start out by looking at the WHO FCTC and tobacco harm reduction, and I will then move on to the EU TPD and tobacco harm reduction. I will then look at how the FCTC and the TPD interact with each other and how the COVID-19 pandemic, which recently came along, may affect this interaction. I will then conclude by raising a few key questions to be considered when discussing these issues. The WHO FCTC is an international convention on tobacco control. Its final text was agreed in March 2003 and it became binding international law in February 2005. It currently has 182 parties. Its objective is to continually and substantially reduce the prevalence of tobacco use and also the prevalence of exposure to tobacco smoke. Potentially reduced harm tobacco and nicotine products were discussed at the time when a tax was agreed, but they were not explicitly recognized by the FCTC text. Over the 15 years since 2005, Tobacco and nicotine products with the potential to reduce the harm caused by tobacco use have progressed from what was then seen as merely a concept to a reality found in most marketplaces. The formal text of the FCTC only covers tobacco products. These are products entirely or partially made of the leaf of tobacco as a raw material to be used for smoking, sucking, chewing or sniffing. There appears to be a broad consensus amongst the FCTC parties that what the FCTC COP calls heated tobacco products or HTPs do fall within this definition. By the COP we mean the conference of the parties of the FCTC which is its governing body which meets biannually. Where the FCTC has struggled is in the area of what it calls electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS, more commonly known through its main configuration which is the e-cigarette. For the purpose of this presentation it is important that we keep in mind these two separate categories of emerging novel products as they are treated differently by both the FCTC and regulators. The instinctive approach of the FCTC towards heated tobacco products has been to insist that they should, without exception, be made subject to all available tobacco control measures. The main debate going forward is therefore whether this in this approach is in fact a valid one. The FCTC approach to ENDS has been under discussion for more than a decade and this discussion is still ongoing. The outcomes achieved so far have at best been inconclusive as I will show in the further discussion. The shortcomings in the FCTC text, the nature of the conference of the parties of the FCTC, the fact that the Conference of the Parties only meets every two years and the still developing evidence base have all played a role in the ENDS debate and this will be covered as I proceed. In the next five slides I will take a look at what has happened at FCTC COP1 to COP8 and then also in the run-up to COP9 which was originally scheduled to take place in November 2020. Now from COP1, which took place in Geneva, to COP3, which took place in Durban in South Africa, there was no significant mention of either of the two reduced harm product categories. 
The reason for this was quite simple in the sense that they were still emerging and were not gaining a lot of attention at the time. By COP4, however, concern was expressed about the quality, the safety and the so-called regulatory gap of newly emerging products, and the focus was mainly on ENDS, and it was requested that the report be prepared for COP5. The report tabled at COP5 invited parties to consider that a ban of ENDS, as already undertaken by some parties at that point, would contribute to changing social norms regarding the consumption of tobacco products. COP5, however, did not take up on this point and ended with a further request to COP6 for another report. And this report was requested to cover two points. The first was options for the prevention and control of ENDS, and the second was an examination of the emerging health impacts of ENDS use. The report tabled at COP6 stated that smokers will obtain the maximum health benefit if they completely quit both tobacco and nicotine use. It went on to say that the Convention itself commits parties to preventing and reducing nicotine addiction independently from its source and that the recreational use of nicotine was not a public health option under the treaty. After much debate, as could have been expected, COP6 only invited parties to at least take certain measures. These measures, firstly, are aimed at preventing the initiation of ends by use. Secondly, they are aimed at minimizing the potential health risks to ends users. And thirdly, they are aimed at preventing unproven health claims on ends being made when it is marketed. Parties were further invited to consider prohibiting or regulating ends under a range of product headings as appropriate, taking into account a high level of protection for human health. This last sentence is an indication that there was no real overarching consensus at COP6 and that it was left to parties to act in accordance with their own national priorities and circumstances. A further report on ENDS was then requested for COP7. Neither the subsequent report to COP7 nor the decision taken at COP7 raised any significant issues, as these documents simply focused on the limited range of regulatory options already put forward at COP6. This reflected the fact that the parties were still divided on whether to regulate or ban ends, were still divided on the product headings under which to do so, and were still expressing a need for further research on the long-term health impacts of ends. Despite the fact that another report on ends was tabled by the FCTC Secretariat at COP8, there was no official decision on ends taken at the end of COP8. There were, however, discussions on the relatively slow-moving process of the work on the evidence base on the possible negative health effects of long-term ends use. What happened instead at COP8 was that significant launch activity on heated tobacco products and the creation of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World shifted attention away from ENDS and shifted it towards novel and emerging tobacco products. COP8 requested a comprehensive report on novel tobacco products and the regulatory challenges they were allegedly posing, while reminding parties to fully regulate them as tobacco products. The run-up to COP9 was initially dominated by the so-called e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury events or IVALI events, which took place in the United States of America during the second half of 2019. This caused a shift in the focus of public health authorities 
away from heated tobacco products and back to ends. At the same time, the World Health Organization was pressed by its eastern Mediterranean region for clearer guidance on ends. One part of the EMRO approach was to argue that ends had no role to play in especially lower and middle income countries where smoking incidents were still high and could be addressed by traditional tobacco control measures as contained in the FCTC. The World Health Organization also at the same time informally expressed support for an earlier view now published in the Lancet Medical Journal which is that tobacco harm reduction should only be allowed in a so-called medicalized format. Despite the fact that the evidence based on the Iwali issue became clearer by early 2020, the WHO still announced a global consultation on novel and emerging nicotine and tobacco products, which was to have taken place in June 2020, five months before the COP, which was scheduled for November 2020. This consultation was clearly aimed at supporting the upcoming COP in November 2020, but in the meantime, this COP had been postponed to November 2021, and the global consultation on novel and emerging tobacco products has also been put on hold. So where we are at this point in time is that both at the WHO level and at the FCTC COP level, we are facing a period of inactivity towards 2021. And I will therefore now shift this presentation to the Tobacco Products Directive in the European Union and then on to the interaction between the, the Tobacco Products Directive and the FCTC. The second version of the EU Tobacco Products Directive, or the TPD as we call it, was adopted in April 2014 for transposition into member state law by 20 May 2016. This new directive uh, of 2014 replaced the earlier directive of 2001. The new directive requires that novel tobacco products be notified to authorities and fully regulated as tobacco products. It treats ends as a separate product category and it only regulates some aspects of electronic cigarettes and refill containers, but it does so in quite a lot of detail. The directive requested a report on the potential risks to public health associated with the use of refillable electronic cigarettes and also containers by 20 May 2016. The directive as a whole is subject to a further complete review starting with a report to be published at the latest by 20 May 2021. The TPD mainly regulates electronic cigarettes and refill containers from a short term, also known as a quality and safety risk perspective. The 2016 report on e-cigarettes and refillable containers also only dealt with these issues. The directive as it stands now does not fully cover all the regulatory aspects listed in the COP6 decision on ENDS, as it preceded the COP6 decision in time. The directive also does not cover regulating ends from the perspective of its longer term health risks or benefits or its impact on tobacco control. These issues are expected to be addressed by the 2021 report on the TPD, which will include proposed amendments to the directive. As part of the upcoming review of the TPD, the EU Commission has mandated its Scientific Committee on Health, Environmental and Emerging Risks, also known as SHEAR, to produce an opinion on certain aspects of e-cigarette use. These aspects are health effects, 
and the impact on cessation and initiation. This opinion is expected in September, October 2020. The EU Commission has also instructed a further study assessing how specific products, novel products and e-cigarettes included, are perceived by the public. This study will also map consumer preferences and use patterns. The two studies will most likely guide the report on the TPD expected by 20 May 2021. Over the last two years, the EU has also noted some shape and vape issues and it has taken notice of the US Iwali phenomenon. Its own notification systems have, however, not raised significant concerns. With the COP9 process having been delayed by one year until November 2021, it is now time to turn to the interaction between the TPD review process and the FCTC process. When we look at the TPD, we will see that its text states that the report on its review shall indicate, in particular, the elements of the directive which should be reviewed or adapted in the light of scientific and technical developments, including the development of internationally agreed rules and standards on tobacco and related products. I need to pause for a small moment to say that internationally agreed rules and standards, of course, uh, has a certain meaning, but that the FCTC COP also produces other guidance which may not fall within this meaning, but which may also influence the TPD process. Now, until the delay of COP9 by one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the EU was quite well placed in relation to the TPD process, in the sense that it could gather its evidence and its views, and it could then participate at the COP9 in November 2020 before it would have had to publish its report on the TPD review in 2021. It was therefore in a position where it could go to the COP to influence the COP, to validate its approaches at the COP without having had to publish its report beforehand. The pandemic has now changed this expected sequence of events. And unless the EU decides to also delay its study and its report on the TPD by one year, it will actually have to publish its study before it goes to the new COP9 in November 2021. And this raises quite a few issues in terms of what can be expected next. In conclusion, I would like to raise a few questions which I believe the participants to this conference may want to discuss amongst themselves or may want to consider in their own time. My first question is about the World Health Organization and whether it may feel obliged to create and publish further guidance on newly emerging products under its own auspices given the postponement of FCTC COP9. Until the postponement, it was clear that the WHO would conduct a global consultation on these products and that the outcome would be fed into COP9. With COP9 having been postponed, the WHO may feel obliged to respond to requests to provide guidance and may take some interim initiatives on its own. My second question is about the potential impact of the change in the timings of the COP on firstly the TPD review and secondly the COP itself. Until the postponement, the TPD review process and the COP were to some extent synchronized in the sense that the EU Commission could conclude its studies, could informally form its views, could attend the COP to promote or defend or validate its views, 
and could then come back from the COP and publish its final report, which will include proposed amendments to the directive. This sequence of events no longer exists, and one will have to consider how this will impact on both the TPD review and the COP9 process. My third question is about the United Kingdom having left the European Union. Until now, the United Kingdom has followed quite an evidence-based approach to newly emerging products, and it has clearly been an influential partner uh, in the European Union and informing the views of the EU. The question would be how the United Kingdom will put its views forward uh, at COP9. Will it act by itself on its own behalf? or will it still align with the EU as part of forming a WHO Europe viewpoint? My first question is about the evidence base which the COP will use to take its decisions on heated tobacco products and ends. There are concerns that there are existing long-term biases and that the evidence base may not be comprehensive inclusive and balanced. This is a concern which will have to be considered as we move towards COP9. My second last question is about the rights of individuals. In the debate on newly emerging products, the overarching focus has been on public health and quite often there has not been enough focus on the rights of individuals in their individual capacity to have access to products which could reduce their shorter term risk or the longer term harm to their health. This balance between public health and individual health is a debate which certainly also has to be part of the way in which the COP looks at newly emerging products. Lastly, my question is a about what would be a realistic expectation from the proceedings of COP9. Some stakeholders have raised the possibility of COP9 starting a process of amending the FCTC text. This is a credible request given the way in which newly emerging products have become a reality over the last 10 to 15 years, but it is also problematic in the sense that amending the text of a convention is quite a long and time-consuming uh, process. Other stakeholders are asking the FCTC COP to produce quite a, a strong ideologically biased set of guidance. Uh, this is quite a concern to many stakeholders in the sense that ideology should never take the place of a more evidence-based approach. There are also those people who are saying that the COP being so divided on ends will not be able to provide a single defined outcome and that it at most could look at an outcome which accommodates many different viewpoints as we have seen uh, before. In the end, I think a realistic expectation from the COP would be a flexible, evidence-based set of guidelines taking into account what has happened over the last 15 years, uh, taking into account uh, all aspects related to tobacco harm reduction and an outcome which eventually will make tobacco harm reduction a reality and support it instead of taking an ideological viewpoint uh, against it.